Hi everyone. Welcome to Wildlife Wednesday today. My name is Jessica Curry and I'm a specialist of science, knowledge and innovation at WWF Canada. I conduct research and data analysis at the organization. Specifically, I work with big data to showcase patterns and trends using data visualization tools. So because I work mostly with numbers, I've recruited a species expert for our Wildlife Wednesday today. So joining us is Emily Giles. Emily, are you here? Hi. Hi, hi Jessica. Would you like to tell our audi audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm very excited to be here today doing another Wildlife Wednesday. These are always so much fun. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a, a wildlife biologist here at WWF Canada, and I've worked for with WWF for about 14 years now. Um, my background is in zoology and conservation biology, and I'm on the same team as Jessica. We're on the science, knowledge, and innovation team. So we do a lot of the background research for the organization. Um, specifically, I work on research and issues related to species at risk here in Canada. Uh, so the reason that I got um, working at WWF is because I'm a huge wildlife lover. Um, I love all sorts of animals. Um, and when I was a little kid, I was absolutely obsessed with animals and really wanted to have a job uh, where I worked with, with animals when I grew up. So um, yeah, that's why I'm very happy to be here chatting about, about uh, our Wildlife Wednesday animal today. I want to be chatting with you about any questions that you have about the animals and hopefully uh, I can get you excited about this species. So um, today we're going to be talking about a species that probably most people don't know about. Um, I know that our CEO, Megan Leslie, knows this animal very well. It's her favorite animal. And uh, I, I'm sure many of you will also love this animal after we, we dig into it a little bit. Um, so today we're going to talk about pikas. Uh, <laughs> How cute that little guy is. <laughs> They are absolutely adorable. And I know as like scientists, we're supposed to be, you know, non-emotional about things and kind of remove that that bias. But I have to say, I do have a, a bias towards pikas because they are cute. They are so cute. And um, I, I'm not a species specialist myself there, Emily. So my cool facts always end up coming from you, essentially, every time. <laughs> um, but one thing before we kind of kick it off, I know there's some debate about whether it's called a pika or a pika. So do you have anything for us on that? <laughs> it's a great question. It's funny, we, we had this debate last week on a, a team call to at WWF. I say pika. Um, I know my British colleagues say pika, but I think really it's like, tomato, tomato, it doesn't matter either way. I've heard okay. other people on the west coast of Canada say pika. Um, I kind of like pika because it's more resembles their cute little call that they make. They make like a very cute little screeching call, which we'll hear later on. I won't. Uh, I was about to make you do it. So I yeah, guess I'll let you I off the hook. I won't do it. Um, and I did want to note too, I want to hear from everyone that's watching right now too. If, if you guys have an opinion, if you think it's pika versus pika, feel free to, to write that in the comments. If you've ever seen a pika in the wild, let us know where you've seen it. There's um, 18 different species of, of pika around the world. So maybe you've seen pikas while hiking in the Himalayas or in Rocky Mountains in Canada. So um, yeah, let us know where you've seen them. Definitely. And they're so adorable, but as we, I'm looking at this picture behind our faces here and it kind of looks like a rodent. Is it a rodent? It, it does. It, it looks like a rodent. It looks like a, looks like a hamster or a guinea pig, really. Yeah. Um, but it's actually uh, a mammal that belongs to the same group of species as rabbits and hares, a group that's called lagomorphs. Uh, that's the, the scientific name. Um, so lagomorphs is a group of animals that includes pikas, rabbits, and hares. Um, and actually, since they look like small rabbits and, and they live among rocks, early biologists actually called them rock rabbits. Um, I've also called them, heard them being called whistling hares. Um, so they've got a bunch of, of different names. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned, there are 18 different species around the world. Um, they're typically found in, in mountainous regions. Um, they like, they, they actually are, are very well adapted to the cold. They like those cold regions that are found at high altitudes. Um, 
there's a, a species called the large eared pika that's found in the Himalayas. And it's found at heights of more than 6,000 meters. Um, wow. So that's that's amongst, you know, the highest elevation that, that other mammals reach too. It's pretty quite quite an incredible animal. And here in Canada, we have two species. We have the Rocky Mountain or the American pika, pika as well as the collared pika. So today we're gonna to talk mainly about the collared pika. Um, we're gonna talk about that since it's designated as special concern. So it's therefore of conservation concern and one that at WWF we're, we're keeping our eye on. I can see its little collar in the picture as well. Yeah, exactly. That's where it's got its name from. It's got that white buffy collar around its neck. Um, great, I can see there's some questions and comments coming in already. So awesome, please keep them coming. I'll, I'll get to them in, in just a minute. Um, just, just a little bit more in, in terms of, of an intro. Um, the collared pika here in Canada is found in Western Canada. Um, it's Northern BC, Yukon and the Northwest Territories. And these little guys are herbivores. So they eat um, plants, obviously being a herbivore. Um, and unlike other small mammals, they don't hibernate which is um, something I find quite, quite interesting. They're solitary animals. They live in these rocky boulder fields. Um, they have to have alpine meadows and enough uh, food source next to their, their home too. So they like to, they like to live next to these alpine meadows. They spend a lot of time grazing um, and a lot of time defending their territories. Ooh. So, <laughs> they also camouflage quite well. I was noticing in the video footage there that I was having a hard time seeing them. I should probably put on my glasses next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. They they're, um, they they blend very well into their environment. They've got that buffy gray coat, um, which blends right in with the rocks. So if, if you're out in the Rocky Mountains or, or out on the west coast of Canada and you're looking for the pika, it's best actually to listen first for their cry, see if you can hear that alarm call. And then once you hear that, then you can try and focus in and, and find them from there. Cool. Uh, yeah. So I have a couple of questions for you before we dig into our audience's questions. So sure. um, you had mentioned that they don't hibernate, which seems weird because in the territories that you mentioned and in those high altitudes, it must be really, really cold. So how do they survive like our Canadian harsh winters? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, because Canada, as, as all of us know, is is a harsh place to live, especially for the collared pika that lives um, really, really high north in Canada. Um, so what they do is they have to create food caches or food stores so that they have enough food to survive the winter. Um, and they have a they have a really neat way of doing this. In the summer, they're they're always really busy um, gathering cuttings there there's a cute picture of it there or a video of it there they're collecting grass collecting uh, plant material what they do is they actually dry them out um, they find like a sheltered place where the sun's hitting and they dry dry out all of these grasses and sedges and plants um, and then they store them for the winter so that that they've got food to survive so that enables them to stay awake and active all all winter long it's a it's a process called haying um, and uh, they create these hay piles. And sometimes they make up to 100 trips in one single day. Um, Holy moly. Yeah. So they are busy. <laughs> 100 trips, imagine. I would, <laughs> that would be exhausting if we had to go 100, do 100 trips for our food every day. Yeah, and actually I did want to mention too, the BBC has a very cute, um, it's a very short little documentary. It's about three minutes long. I think we're going to post uh, the clip to that. It's a very cute little clip of, of Pika's and, and shows them out making their adorable alarm call and and making these hay piles so you should check that out so making preserves for the winter exactly yeah all right well in addition to that you kind of mentioned that they're very territorial and i assume that has something to do with the fact that they spend all of this energy going to collect their food i would be too if it took me a hundred trips a day to go uh get my food cash so um it's what are they defending i guess i think i might have answered the or answered that question, but it seems like so much work. So it's interesting. Yeah, it, it is a ton of work. So they're defending their territory from each other. Um, they're, they're what's called kleptoparasitic, which mm -hmm. means that they do steal food from one another. So, you know, even though they look very cute and innocent, if, if you're another pika, you have to watch your food store and make sure that uh, another pika isn't going to, to come and take it from you because you need that food store to make it through the winter. So 
they're quite protective of it. Wow. So they're kleptos. Okay. So they're defending from each other. So not necessarily like another animal that's coming in. No, not, not, not their food stores. Um, when they do make this, this high pitched alarm call that, that, uh, I think we'll, we'll hear in a clip. Um, that high pitched alarm is, is used to warn about predators coming in. Um, and also to, to try and fend their hay piles from, from other pikas. Very cool. And the last thing I have here is that uh, you had mentioned that they're special concerns. So just for our audience's sake, do you mind telling us what that actually means? Because it kind of just sounds like a random title. So what, <laughs> what makes them um, special concern? Yeah, so special concern is um, a designation that's given to animals under our Species at Risk Act, which is our federal legislation to protect wildlife in Canada. So what it means is that um, there is potential for them to become threatened or endangered in the coming years if, if action is not taken to help protect them now. So in the case of um, pikas, it's climate change that is the biggest threat to them. And climate change is expected to um, having an increasing impact on them in coming years. So I mentioned that um, pikas really like these, these cold environments. They live at high altitudes, they live in the north. Um, and because of that, they're they're very sensitive to changes in temperature and precipitation. So um, they've kind of become the poster child for, for climate change in many ways. So um, if we look at the American pika, for example, so the American pika is the other, the other species that's here in North America, it has been extirpated or become locally extinct throughout some of its range. Um, and that's primarily because there's we're feeling more effects of climate change in, in the southern regions. So we want to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen to the, the collared pika, which is found in more northern regions here. Yeah, that's a good point from a data analysis perspective. So that's where I come in. Uh, we recently did an analysis that looked at threats to species at risk in Canada specifically, and we found that climate change was increasingly being cited as a threat. So it's increasing in prevalence, um, and we kind of know those impacts a lot more than we used to. We used to consider the impacts a lot more like unknown, so it was hard to quantify in any sort of way. So uh, it's definitely becoming an increasing threat for many different species, not just the collared pika. Yeah, and Jessica, I know you were involved with another analysis here at, at WWF that involved the pika. Do you want to explain a little bit about, about that analysis and why the pika was included in, in that one? Sure. So in 2019, so just over a year ago, we released the Wildlife Protection Assessment. So that assessment looked at the ecological representation of a protected areas network. So that's just a fancy way of saying we looked at how our protected areas network in Canada was doing. We looked at the size of our protected areas, the coverage, if they were connected. So if there's some connectivity between two different protected areas. And essentially what we found is that we're not doing so great in terms of our ecological representation. So what we did was we kind of like looked at those areas where we're not doing well, and then we layered in some other factors like species at risk, so the collared pika, and then climate refuges. So these are essentially areas that are anticipated to remain relatively stable in the face of climate change. They will, of course, change, so um, they're not kind of immune to climate change, but in the short term, they're not going to be doing so bad. Um, and what we found is that some species, particularly the colored pika, there's some of its range that is actually in these climate refuges. So although a large portion is not, uh, we can kind of focus on those areas that it is and then recommend those for protected areas planning when we talk to government representatives or to other people as well. So uh, it was a really cool analysis to be working on and it's all about protecting habitat. That's awesome. And it's great that it includes, you know, smaller, lesser known animals like the pika and not just some of the, the larger charismatic ones. That Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Uh, so I think I can take some, there's quite a few <laughs> questions. I know, here, I really yeah, this is Instead awesome. of just having them tick up, we might as well start going through some of them. Um, so we have the first question here. How big are pikas? Ooh, that's a that's a great great question. Um, and actually, I have a little demonstration here, a little sneak peek to help explain how big they are. Um, so they are they're about fifteen to twenty centimeters long. Um, 
so about like half of a standard size ruler, I'd say, um, and about 150 grams. So not very big at all. They're, they're pretty small, but I did want to show what they look like. Uh, I've got kind of an exclusive sneak peek <laughs> here of uh, a WWF adoption kit that we're going to have available this year. Um, the collared Pika. I don't know if he's coming into focus there, but um, so cute. My heart just for two sides. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's pretty cute. Um, so yeah, as I said, he does kind of look like, like they look like a, a little guinea pig or something, even though they are related to rabbits. Um, yeah, so these guys are available for adoption on starting on October 6th, so next week. And we're going to have other species this year as well available for adoption and all the, the funds help uh, WWF and our conservation efforts. So starting tomorrow on our social media channels, check it out because um, we'll we'll drop hints about what the other species are. This is just one of the new new species available for adoption. Okay, I'll put I'll put him away now. <laughs> <laughs> they make really cute Christmas gifts as well. I used to always get them for Christmas. So yeah, me too actually. <laughs> Uh, so I have a question here from Emily. What are Pika's main predators? Good question. Um, so Pika's primarily are predated upon um, by weasels. There's there's different species of weasels that live up north that will prey on them, as well as coyotes, foxes, uh, and birds of prey like like hawks and eagles. Those kinds of things. All right. And we have a couple things of. Pika like a Pikachu. So yes, I guess from a pronunciation perspective, but they kind of look similar too. I don't know if anyone, if we looked into that, but they seem like they could be relevant to each other. <laughs> <laughs> apparently Pikachu, so I, I I have also dug into this a little bit. Apparently, oh, you did? Good. <laughs> yeah, apparently Pikachu is um, actually based on a squirrel uh, and not on the Pika, but yeah. That's the opportunity that's, there. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Um, we were hoping that there is a clip of a sound that we could hear. I have a question. Do you have a clip of what they sound like? And I think we do, if we can flip that up. <laughs> that, was, that was sweet. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we have a lot of cute, cute, love, adorable, so cute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially just a lot of love for the Pika. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So should we maybe flip it back on our audience and we can do some trivia? I do see one more question there that we didn't get to. I just oh, want to make sure I answer perfect. this one. It says, do they live in burrows underground like rabbits and hares? Um, so the, the short answer to that is, is no, they don't. They live in um, these rocky boulder fields um, and they, they rely on existing um, crevices or holes in those, those rocky boulder fields. So they can make, they can make um, you know, an area that already exists bigger, they can expand on it, but they don't dig a burrow like a, like a rabbit. So good question. Okay. So they don't necessarily make their own habitat. Uh, they just occupy something that's already there. <laughs> yes, exactly. Cool. Yeah. That's like the burrowing owl. I know we included that in the Living Planet Report. So I have some, some knowledge of that one in my brain. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. All right. Have we covered them all? I think so. Yeah. I think I think it's our turn now to ask, ask these guys questions and see if they've been paying attention. All right. <laughs> let's do the trivia. True or false, pikas are rodents. Okay, so I've said this one a few times now. Um, I mentioned that although they look like guinea pigs, they might not necessarily be one. So please, uh, if you know the answer to this, type it in the chat. Um, also, if you know the group that they're actually a part of, as I give a very, very strong hint, uh, please type that in the chat as well. Um, this one, I think is easy and everyone so far is getting it, it seems. So we've got uh, Jared says false, Kaylee says false, Christopher says false, Marco says false. Yeah, okay. No getting all getting correct. that one passed. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are all right. It's false. They are related to uh, rabbits and in that same group called Legomorpha. 
Yeah, Jacqueline. Clearly, we need to make these a little more difficult. Eh? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next question. What is the biggest threat to pikas in Canada? Okay, so I think this one also might be quite easy because we, we talked about this quite a bit. Um, and it's something that for the collared pika anyway, it's not it's not necessarily right now a huge, um, huge pressing threat that has had direct impact on its current population numbers. But in the future, we expect it's going to have massive impact on, on the pika. And in other parts of the world, it already is having impact and we're seeing, we're seeing declines in local extirpations because of this threat. So again, you guys were paying attention. I see lots of answers coming in here. And yes, it is climate change. Uh, sadly, pikas, like like many other species, are are threatened by by climate change, um, and in particular for these cold loving species like the pika, it's it's going to be particularly hard for them. So great, I think I think everyone. Oh, Lawrence said coyotes or climate change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Next question: How many species of pika or pika are there in Canada? So you said a couple different numbers here, Emily. So I'm hoping this one will actually trip a couple people up. Oh, okay. Well, hopefully, because everyone has gotten all the answers so far. <laughs> um, yeah, I did. Uh, I think I think I said this in my introduction and uh, named the various species. So yeah, bonus points if you can say how many species they are and, and what their names are. So um, yeah, so I see Jacqueline says, two species, uh, Quota says two. Oh my gosh, Clement, okay, we've got, Clement we have really paying attention. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he says two and he's named them, the American and the collared, exactly. So great, glad you guys, glad you guys are listening. <laughs> so there were two in Canada and the other number that was said was 18 in North America. Was 18 it? around the world. 18 around the world, see, yeah. Yeah. me up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, next question. Where is the collared pika found in Canada? So maybe <laughs> looking for the provinces, territories, that sort of thing. I like uh, Laurent's, Laurent's last answer to the last one was not enough. <laughs> that's, that should be the right answer. <laughs> Good answer. Um, okay, so I, I think also um, I did talk explicitly about where they're found here in Canada. Uh, and I did mention that they like the north. There's, that's a bit of a hint. Um, and they also like the west coast of Canada where we've got mountains. So big hints for you guys there on that one. A um, couple of couple of people are, are coming in. Yep, we've got, got uh, British Columbia, Northwest Territories, and Yukon. Uh, so yeah, you guys got it. Also, in, um, they're also in, the, uh, in Alaska. So also in the US as well, the colored pika but specifically BC, uh, sorry, specifically Canada, it's BC, Northwest Territories and Yukon. Great. Awesome. Thanks that's... for participating, everyone. That was good responses. Yeah, we got, we, people were listening. We got lots of right answers, so that's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, my comment ticker is just climbing over there. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's awesome. Well, thanks for tuning in today, everyone. It's always fun to learn a little more about a species that we work on here at WWF Canada. And we encourage you to tune into our Wildlife Wednesdays at the last Wednesday of every month. So we try to keep it at the same time. So it would be 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, 4 p.m. where I am, which is on Atlanta, Canada. Um, and yeah, so check out the next one in about a month's time. And we'd love to hear your suggestions of new species to highlight as well, uh, just to freshen it up and to keep everyone else engaged. And Emily, do you want to show me the adorable <laughs> little pika that we have for adoption? Yeah, I just wanted to say say thanks again and be sure to uh, check out this, this pika that we've got on our website as of next week on October 6th. And um, yeah, be sure to check out that BBC video and uh, learn as much as you can about this adorable Canadian species. All right, thanks so much we for tuning in. a joke, Emily? Oh, you wanted to end on a joke, of course. I have mean, you got, have I you have got one ready to go? One in. I do have one. I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Yep. Why did Emily stay up late on Christmas Eve? <laughs> I have no idea. Why, why did I stay up late on Christmas Eve? 
she wanted to get a Pika Santa. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a, that's a great note to end on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, All right. Bye guys. Bye.